Uh, hey, everyone. Uh, I see in the back, I think there's a couple seats over here if you want to come on down. And there's uh, two here and one here. So if you want to grab a seat, uh, please come on down. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm Mike Rios. I'm the Chief Innovation Officer and co-founder of 17 Triggers. Uh, we're a social innovation lab. And rather than just talk about what we do, I figure I'd show you a little bit. So I'm going to show a short video. Hi, I'm Lily Diaz. And I'm Mike Rios. And we're... You guys ready? <laughs> Gotta wake you up for the afternoon. So excited, super excited to be here. It's a big honor. I'm gonna put this gong away. I might bring it out later if anyone falls asleep. Uh, so yeah, we're, we're a social innovation lab. Uh, you, what you just saw was the tip of the iceberg. Um, so we do do marketing. Uh, we also do research and we design programs, uh, systems and services uh, for good causes around the world. And hold on. Oops, I have it the wrong way. And Skoll had us come here because we take a lot from the social sector, from Silicon Valley, and the different methods that they use to uh, design tech services, and we apply that to the social sector. And we've been experimenting for the last five years with a number of different techniques, with a number of different organizations around the world. Uh, and we wanted to share with you a few of those techniques. And to start us off, I'm going to talk a little bit about behavioral science. Um, so I'm not a neurologist. I think there is one behavioral science neurologist here. So if I say anything wrong, I'm sorry. Um, I'm just a nerd about it. And the reason why is because uh, behavioral science is really, really important for everything that we're doing. Um, and just to define it, let's say that behavioral science is a study of human behavior and how we make decisions. And to make it a little bit more personal, let's start with ourselves and the decisions that we make on a day-to-day -day basis. So, Every day, we wake up and we have a decision. Some of us exercise, some of us do not. Who does cardio four days a week, let's say? Wow, this is, that's a lot. I was not, I, 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 I'm not used to that uh, amount of numbers. Probably a lot of type A personalities, so we, let's just scrap the whole, uh, let's scrap the whole presentation. Um, that's the first time I've done that and that many hands went up, by the way. Um, so, you know, a lot of people actually use, usually do not do that much uh, cardio that, that often. Um, and so, yeah, I, I'm totally thrown off by that. Um, anyway, um, so we'll move on to the next one. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands. I'm just going to say that probably a lot of us know uh, that we should be eating a lot of fruits and vegetables, right? Uh, but we probably, a lot of us also do not eat as healthy as we should, right? Um, probably everyone knows someone who smokes. Uh, and also, they know that they probably should not, and it's not good for their health. Probably a lot of us could save more money. And for all the social entrepreneurs in the room, I know you are not getting seven to eight hours of sleep every night. So why is it so hard for us to make good decisions? And more importantly, uh, if we can't help ourselves to make good decisions, how can we really help the masses to make good decisions? So if we smoke, and we can't quit smoking, how can we really help others to quit smoking? Um, if we don't eat healthy, how can we expect that a mother will feed her baby to eat healthier? Or if we are bad at saving money, how can we expect that our sales agent can get other people to save more money? Or if we don't listen to a doctor's orders, how can we get a midwife, and how can we expect a midwife to teach a mo young mother to uh, follow her orders? So human behavior and understanding human behavior is very important. And so for this talk, I'm going to show you a few ways on how to influence human behavior through uh, design. And not designing logos or comic books, but how can you design better programs, 
uh, systems and services. But before getting into that, we need to first understand the answer to this question. Why is it so hard for us to make decisions? So a bunch of you have a piece of paper. and If you don't have a piece of paper, maybe you can borrow from a neighbor. Um, what I want you to do to answer this question, I'm going to have you all draw an elephant. We're going to take about 30 seconds. Draw an elephant on the bottom left-hand corner of your piece of paper. Yeah, just dive, dive right in. You can draw your own. Draw your own elephant. Yes, yes. All right, good, nice. Yes, very good. There's always one elephant that looks like a dog whenever we do this, by the way. I'm seeing where, whose that is. All right, take a few more seconds. Draw your best elephant. Good, good. Now, secondly, on top of that elephant, when you finish, I want you to draw a picture or an illustration of an elephant rider. But the elephant rider is a very special person. I want you to draw an illustration of your neighbor to your right riding on the elephant. So go to. <laughs> Yeah. On, the right. on, on your right, yeah. You pick, yeah. Can I pick? Yeah. <laughs> all right, make sure you get all the details in there. Are you drawing me? Nice. <laughs> okay, about 10 more seconds. Again, make sure you get everything in there. All righty, good. All right, and go ahead and show your neighbor. Yeah, that's your good ones. Nice. I, I'm clearly not. Wow, I love this. I love whatever's going on there. Yeah, that's great. Okay. Okay. All right. I do not necessarily advise drawing pictures of other people outside of this room or exercise, by the way. Um, but glad that you're all having fun with it. Now, lastly, I want you to draw a path. Yeah? So draw a path on that. Oh, if you gave away the illustration, yeah, just bring it right back. Yeah. And go ahead and draw a path. So your elephant and elephant rider are on a path. OK. So you should have an elephant rider, an elephant, and a path. And so this is a behavior change framework that was outlined in a book called Switch uh, by the Heath Brothers. See some of you nodding. It's a very, very good book. Um, a little bit biased because Chip's one of our advisors. Uh, and basically, they took, this, uh, took a metaphor by uh, Jonathan Haidt, who's a, uh, a famous psychologist. He also wrote a book that Kevin Starr was mentioning or showed uh, in the last talk. Uh, so Jonathan Haidt, he was looking at our different uh, systems of decision making, our rational uh, system and our emotional system. And a lot of people think the rational side has control, uh, but actually our emotional side has, has greater control than our rational side. And so he used the elephant and the elephant rider as a metaphor to represent this. So within each one of us, we have an elephant rider and an elephant. And a lot of people think the elephant rider has control. After all, it's on top, right? And the elephant rider is telling the elephant what to do, where to go. Yeah? But this elephant is a huge beast. It's an animal, right? If it's angry, if it's sleepy, if it's hungry, it's going to do whatever it wants to do. And that's why for normal people, they usually do not exercise, <laughs> right? <laughs> Well, you all are superhuman, so um, that's why many people have difficulty uh, eating healthy all the time, especially if they see a friend ordering something that maybe the elephant might like a little bit more, right? So our elephant rider knows that we shouldn't be eating this type of thing, but our elephant is motivated every day to eat the elephant, and that's why a lot of decisions are, are, are very difficult to take the healthier decision. But also advertising and marketing, marketers, they really know how to play with your emotions. They know how to manipulate and change your emotions very well. Uh, I'm a former creative ad man. Uh, I've been in the belly of the beast of creative advertising agencies. So I can tell you, we're constantly thinking of ways to toy with your elephant. Um, and 
For example, let's just take this. Which, which mashed potatoes would you order? <laughs> now, what's interesting is that in the last 15 years, we're now able to look into the human brain because of technology, and we can see why people are making certain decisions when they're making it. So you can look at someone who's ordering velvety mashed potatoes with garlic and rosemary. We can see them eat it, and they will actually enjoy it more. Their elephants will enjoy it more than the other mashed potatoes, even though they might be the exact same thing. Also, you might enjoy these velvety mashed potatoes with garlic and rosemary so much that you come back to the restaurant. So this one little, little twist on, on a few old words will make you come back to that restaurant. Marketers also know that if you're going to buy wine, if they're playing French music in the aisle, 77%, I believe, or 78% of people will buy French wine. And you ask them why you bought French wine, none of them will know that, or very few will say, oh, because French music was playing. So your, your elephant reacts to a lot of things subconsciously. Also, on speaking of wine, the elephant really loves price. So you can give someone a $90 bottle of wine and you tell them it's a $10 bottle of wine, they won't like it very much. Whereas you can give someone a $10 bottle of wine and tell them it's $90 and they'll like it a lot. Um, and the, so your elephant is actually tasting the price. Um, anyone that wants to use this as a party trick, go ahead. Um, you can just say that you're always buying an expensive bottle of wine. Marketers also do this all the time when we're shopping. Um, so they know that not many people will buy the most expensive TV, but they want you to buy the middle one because there's a higher margin. They just put the expensive TV there so that the middle TV looks like a better price, right? So we're, ne we're never really rational creatures, even in our buying decisions, and marketers are constantly taking advantage of that. But that's just marketers. The most interesting part of this framework, in, in my view, is the path, or the environment, the systems, or services, and programs for, for entrepreneurs, for NGOs, for organizations, how you're creating uh, an environment, or how you're creating your system. So let's say, for example, you want to quit smoking. Rationally, your elephant rider knows that you shouldn't smoke. Emotionally, it, uh, it can be very, very difficult, especially if you have an addiction or you have a habit, right? But the environment will be the greatest dictator of whether or not you'll be successful. So say, for example, you have friends, uh, and all your friends smoke regularly. Anyone who's tried to smoke knows that's a very difficult experience, because your friend will be, oh, come on, you can just have one, or they'll slip you one, and that affects your path, right? Um, but let's say, for example, you move, you move cities, and you move to a city where you're making new friends. Say none of your friends smoke. Say even that the restaurants and bars ban smoking. Your environment there, or your path, is shaped in a way that you're more likely to quit smoking. So the path is the most, one of the most critical points. Let's say, for example, that Jeff Skoll, he has a personal mission this year, and he wants everyone to eat more broccoli. Okay? Rationally, we can, okay, we know broccoli is healthy for us. Emotionally, maybe Jeff does a lot of advertising for you know, why you should eat broccoli. Maybe he makes it cool, and people are like, yeah, I'm going to eat broccoli this year. Um, but then probably none of you will eat broccoli here at Skull World Forum if you can't actually find any broccoli, or if it's only in one small tent area of the tent, right? You're not going to eat any broccoli, no matter how attracted you are to it. What about choco pies? Who, who had a choco pie today? <laughs> yeah, why why'd you, why'd you guys eat a choco pie? Right? Because it's right there in front of you. Rationally, do you know that it's unhealthy for you? Yeah? yeah? Okay. Emotionally, how do you feel? It's there? You're smelling the chocolate? Yeah. It's great, right? Yeah? Now, what we did is we, we've, we've taken the book uh, uh, Switch and we've started to break it up into three different checklist points. So if we want to change people's behaviors, we want to check as many of these as possible. Um, the path is pretty much mandatory, though, and if you want to change a lot, of, a lot of people's behaviors. So in this case, you all know how to eat a choco pie. Right? You don't, no one needs to teach you how to eat a choco pie. Um, your elephant's motivated because it looks tasty. Uh, and the path, that's where I just changed the path for you, because I just gave you a choco pie. Um, now, let's see a quick show of hands. How many people ate a choco pie again? Okay, interesting. So I, I had a theory. I'm not, I'm not sure. It's looking about the same. I had a theory that people that would have the, if you notice, some choco pies uh, have no wrapper and some have a wrapper, right? So I was trying to motivate your elephant even more because you can smell these choco pies where you can't smell those ones. Uh, and also I made the path a little bit easier because it's right in, right in front of you and you don't have to take off the wrapper. 
I did this to illustrate that changing the path, even in small ways, can, have big, can, can pr possibly provide big changes in the way you design programs. Um, so let's say, for example, we want uh, mothers to give better newborn care to their babies. Do the elephant rider, or do they know clearly what to do? Uh, well, maybe not, because there's a lot of information out there, and it probably depends on the country that you're working in, right? Uh, does the, is the elephant motivated? Yeah, it's their baby. They want to take care of them. Um, and does the path make it easy for them to change the behaviors? So, for example, the mother-in-law, uh, if you see on the left, the nagging mother-in-law, she might make it really difficult for a mother to follow instructions from a health center. So here a mother-in-law is telling this mother to, to roast. Um, so you, literally there, there are coals there, uh, and it's kind of like a sauna. And this is really, really bad for mothers. It depletes breast milk. But it's really hard to ignore the nagging mother-in-law, right? Especially in, in Southeast Asian culture. Um, so that path makes it really difficult for her to change, no matter what the midwife says. Or if you want to convince people to save more, uh, if you want your staff to convince people to save more, does your staff, do they actually know how to convince people to save more? Are they trained? And are they motivated? Are there the right incentives for them? Especially, we see a lot of mobile banking services. Uh, people are, they, they have little shops and they're doing all these other things. Is this really worth it for them to spend their time? And does the path make it easier? So if they have a lot of customers coming in all the time and it takes 20, 30 minutes to convince someone to, to, you, to save money with their mobile phone, maybe your, your path is not really suited to do that. Or what if the service doesn't work? Uh, we recently took 120 bankers in Uganda. We took them all out to the field uh, to, to try to sign up for a mobile banking service. We split them up in five groups, and only one group could actually even sign up. Right? So in this case, no matter, how, even if you had the other two things, you wouldn't be able to actually get them to do it. So this leads to two very important questions when we're designing programs. How can we motivate the elephant? And how can we make the path easier? And this is with design. So again, not designing logos or comic books, but designing better programs, systems, and services. So let's take this framework, and we're going to put it aside, um, just set it aside uh, for your mind for now. And I'm going to share a story about, from the private sector to show the power of great design or a great service. So about a year and a half ago, I had a meeting with Google. And uh, after my meeting, I was going to meet a mentor. And he, he, I, I text messaged him the address. Uh, and he text messaged me back. He said, Mike, really sorry. I can't pick you up anymore. Uh, I'm in a meeting. I can't talk. And then he said, I'm going to send you an Uber. Now, how many people do not know what an Uber is? Just a real quick show of hands. OK, two, three people. Cool. I had no idea what an Uber was either. And, and, and so I'm in San Francisco. This guy can't talk. I'm, I'm like, is this a driverless car? Is it a drone that's going to pick me up? You know. And so I'm just, I'm just standing there, and I'm thinking, and I see a couple people walking by, and I, I run up to them, and I'm like, okay, hey, sorry, I've been living in Cambodia a long time. Um, do you know what an Uber is? <laughs> and their faces lit up with excitement to tell me about Uber. And so if you don't know what Uber is, it's an app, um, and you can, get your, you can get a driver to come just with a push a, but, a button. So you set a pickup location, the driver comes, you can see the little car coming to where you are, uh, and then you ride uh, in the Uber. So, Pretty simple. Um, now, what's great about Uber is that when I got in, it was not like a normal taxi. It smelled nice. Yeah, the the guy was really, really friendly. There was water. There was magazines. I was like, whoa, this is kind of this is kind of crazy. Um, I didn't have to give him directions, so he just drove to to where I was meeting my friend. And then at the end, I said, okay, cool. How much do I owe you? I didn't even have to pay, right? Because my my friend the, the app it gets paid for in the app. I asked him, OK, uh, tip, and I tried to give him a tip. And he said, no, 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 no tips allowed. So I was like, wow, that was a delightful experience. <laughs> and and uh, then I went back to Michigan to give a talk on design thinking. And I wanted to use the same example about Uber and how it's such a great, well-designed service. And so I was at a coffee shop, and I said, hey, um, do, you, do you guys use Uber here? And literally, the whole coffee shop started talking about how much they love Uber. Complete strangers saying how much they love it, right? Crazy. Uh, just talking about how much they love this service more than taxis. Talking about things like Uber ice cream, where you can order uh, ice cream to come right to where you are. Things like the Uber DeLorean car, uh, Back to the Future. You can literally order the Back to the Future car sometimes. Um, or you can have an Uber helicopter, right? Um, 
So why all the buzz? Why all the excitement about this service? It gets down to two things. One, Uber made this ridiculously easier for people. When we look at services and programs, a lot of the times we look at things very rationally, right? We just look at the steps. OK, you got to call the taxi. Then the taxi comes. You get in the taxi. You pay. And we almost weigh them all evenly. That's not very difficult to do. But when we think about it in elephant terms, oh, we have to call the taxi number. We have to give them directions. We're shouting because it's so loud. Then we have to go, and we wait in the rain, and we don't know when the taxi's going to come, and it builds anxiety. And we're just waiting there, and we don't know. We don't know. Whereas Uber, you just push a button. You see the driver. You see how, exactly how many minutes it's going to come. You get in the car and everything is much, much easier. Again, don't even have to pay uh, cash. It was also delightful, right? Um, so again, the, there's magazines in the car. There's water in the car. Um, the driver was incredibly friendly. So something that Uber does, for the couple people who don't know Uber, you, can, you rate your driver afterwards, right? So they keep all the top drivers. And any drivers that are ranked poorly, they kick them out of the system. They can't drive for Uber anymore. So you get a bunch of friendly drivers, right? that are delightful. And stories like this. Probably everyone in that Michigan coffee shop, none of them are actually going to ever do this. right? But it gives them something to talk about that excites them uh, for part of the brand. Very, very delightful. So using this formula, Uber's gotten pretty big, I'd say. 55 countries, 200 cities, 40 billion with a B uh, evaluation. How many uh, social enterprises would like to get there someday? <laughs> so if we look at this checklist and get using an Uber, what's really important is that delight in making things ridiculously easier are, are key components to making change happen. Actually, when we think about all the products that we use in this room, all these brands that are disrupting their fields, they're all ridiculously easier to use, and they're all delightful. Amazon, Uber, uh, Apple, they all have forms of one-click shopping. Right? And they know they get more customers just by changing it from two clicks to one click. Right? Uh, Warby Parker, the glasses that I'm wearing. When you order these glasses, you go order online, and you, can get, uh, you get five pairs sent to your house. You can keep them for a week. You decide which one you like. If you don't like any of them, you send them all back. It's a very, for people who buy glasses, it's a very nice experience. Um, and then when you buy a pair, they also give a pair to Vision Spring, right? Delightful. It's absolutely delightful. And that's why they're able to explode with growth, because people like talking about things that are ridiculously easier and more delightful. Now, this is the social innovation paradox, right? We all say that we want innovation in development. We all say we want innovation in the social sector. But then if we want that, why aren't we hiring designers? Really? How many designers do you know that work in the social space? Probably the most are actually right convening uh, here at, at, at uh, Skoll, right? Uh, but but every day. yes, it's exercise every day. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> I need to be careful. I need to readjust these slides again. But uh, so again, it's, it's a bit of a paradox. So so, so Google Ventures is a 2.5 or sorry, 1.5 billion dollar uh, venture capital fund. They invest in 225 companies, including Uber. And one of the top services that they give their companies is they have a full-time team of designers that work with each of their ventures to make sure things are ridiculously easier and more delightful. And they keep rotating and continuously working with these ventures. All right? Google knows that for every $1 they invest in better design, they get a $2 to $100 return. Right? There's, there's some great studies on this. Uh, and and the, the way that they're calculating this is the increase in sales, increase of referrals and word of mouth, reduce of costs, and also operational efficiencies. So there's all these different gains that bring in designers that design systems and services uh, that you get from, from working with them. So also Google knows that it's the small details. It's this very, very small details. Who knows? Maybe if Uber, if you couldn't see the taxi or the car when it's coming on its way, maybe, maybe it wouldn't be successful. That one small detail, maybe people wouldn't like it as much. It wouldn't be as delightful. Maybe it wouldn't be in 200 countries if this one small detail didn't exist. Maybe if you couldn't rate drivers, and then you know, half the Uber drivers were not very good drivers, and they had smelly cars, and, and they, talked, uh, they, they were not nice to talk to, maybe Uber wouldn't be as big as it was. And this is just one small detail and why design is so, so, so important. But again, social innovation paradox. Google, 
Uh, unlike Google Ventures, the social sector rarely, if ever, uses designers. And it's kind of crazy. Um, and this is why in the social sector we get airports that feel like this, right? Uh, we go to renew our license and we have to wait in lines for a very, very long time. It's why hospitals, so many hospitals are stuffy uh, and you don't know how long you're going to wait. And when we, when, we, when we see this in more in developing countries, it en ends up being with things like this. I don't know if you all saw this in the news recently, um, but this is a school and these are parents climbing up the windows to give the answers to their children on the test, right? Yeah. So a very broken system, right? Or a very poorly designed system. And for anyone that works in water, you know that one of the huge problems within water is that so many water pumps uh, aren't working after a number of years and no one fixes them. Uh, as for people that were in Kevin's last talk, uh, it's kind of like coming in, helping, and then you leave, and, and then these type of things happen, right? Um, one argument could be made that if designers were designing this program or system, they would ensure that those type of things wouldn't happen. Again, very theoretical. Um, but when systems and programs and services aren't designed well, also things break uh, once more and more people go through the system. Um, and you know, we say we want best practices all the time, but are we really following best practices, right? And are we investing in the right kind of rigor? Uh, rigorous is one of my favorite words in the social sector because when someone talks about research, they always say rigorous before they say research. Watch for it, yeah? That's very, very interesting. Um, but then also, like, I've, I've worked on development programs where we're spending half the budget on research and writing reports. World Bank spends one third of their budget on knowledge sharing and reports. They've also done a study on how many people are downloading their reports, and I think one third of them are never downloaded, something like this. Yeah? Um, but thanks to World Bank for making that study. Um, <laughs> it's probably the most downloaded report they've ever written, by the way. Uh, but yeah, are we investing in the right kind of rigor? Or should we be investing in things that actually improve these people's lives? When was the last time a report helped the mother? Or, uh, or, or when, when can a, it, it if a good system can be designed better to help her, why aren't we putting our money there? Again, Uber's success could have been made just on this five-star rating system, a simple design feature. We should be putting just as much time and effort designing systems for the poor. Okay, so how do we make things ridiculously easier and more delightful? So now, that, now that's all the theory, I'm gonna show you a few different ways that we do it. Um, I'm gonna talk about design thinking, right? So I'm very, very excited design thinking is, is coming. Uh, I, I think four or five years ago, no one, it seemed like no one really knew about it, but I'm also in Cambodia, and, and so don't, don't always hear about things. But what's really, really interesting with design thinking is it's kind of like little kids playing soccer. You know, some people are really excited about it, some people are not so excited about it, and it seems like no one understands the point of the game, right? <laughs> you know, we just use big words to describe it, but really no one knows how to win, right? Um, so let's get some common rules out there. Let's say that design thinking, it's all about getting out of your office, finding your user's headaches, curing those headaches, and whoever cures the most headaches wins. Let's just say those are the rules. So how would we apply design thinking uh, in an issue that kills more than malaria and TB? It's about sanitation, open defecation. So IDEO created this $35 easy latrine in Cambodia, and two different organizations came to us to help them uh, sell more. So one's IDE and one's Watershed. Wonderful organizations, great programs. They're now two, two leaders globally for, for sanitation marketing. Um, so Watershed hired us to create an open source set of tools uh, that any organization could use to sell latrines. Uh, and IDE hired us to work with sales consultants to adapt those tools and also to, to uh, redesign their sales system uh, for selling toilets. And so I'm going to show a combination of some of the things that we did for that. So again, design thinking, one of the things is to go out and, and find your user's headaches. So one user is Tola the farmer, the customer who is buying the toilet. That's one user. Um, so what is it like for him to buy a helmet, uh, helmet sorry, um, <laughs> to buy a toilet? So a salesman would pitch to the group, and we literally map this out. Tola goes home and talks with his family. He saves money for the latrine. He calls the salesman and asks questions. Then he buys the latrine. And there's a whole lot of other steps that happens after he buys it. So this is just a high level uh, mapping process, a customer journey. And what we can do, uh, or what we're doing here is we're literally mapping out, in this case, a system of how he gets to buying a toilet. 
And what's, what's critical about this is you can take this to real customers and you can ask, what are your headaches in this journey? Sometimes people call them pain points. And you can start to get consensus around areas that are headaches for them. Um, you can also do this with other users like sales agents. And you start to create a heat map of where there are issues in your service, right? So in this case, uh, pink is the salesman headaches and blue are the headaches of the, um, the, the farmers, right? Um, so we're like, okay, well, what's going on here? There seem to be a few headaches for salespeople here. And so then we can go and we can observe, we can interview them, we can do secret shopper, we can do all these different things to observe. And one of the main things that came up was that selling is really difficult for them. They're not, they're not a trained sales force, right? They're, uh, they're the latrine uh, business owner's brother uh, or the village chief's uh, brother, and they have no idea how to sell toilets. We, sh we see their sales manual, it's thick, they don't really use it. Uh, right, and they, there's all these different bad habits that they have in terms of uh, if you're talking about sales habits, good sales habits, and it's really, really difficult for them. So there's simple things we did to cure that headache. Uh, one, we made this, we turned the thick manual into a seven-step checklist of how to sell toilets. We did a sales pitch flip book um, that they could use so they could have a consistent sales pitch that was very short to use. I'm going to show you a few pages, a um, little bit graphic. Um, so all the, all the behavioral research says if you want someone to use a toilet, you need to discuss them. So that's why we have pictures of real poop. Um, and so this is one of the first pages. So they, they talk about how um, flies transfer real poop onto your food in an in a, in a, in a effort to create disgust. Um, and then also to get them to realize that a lot of these families are spending more on uh, diarrhea or treating diarrhea than an actual latrine. Um, so these are very emotional things for the elephant to, to hear and to, to feel. But then we also excite them in the end by talking about different features that are really unique about this sales service. So you can install this toilet in one day. It's an easy latrine. You can build with any shelter you want, and it's delivered to your home for free. So if you map out the sales service that they had before, um, that was actually one of their big headaches as well, is that just transporting a latrine home, these huge concrete rings and all this, it's a lot of work. Now we can get it delivered for free. That's wonderful. Right? And there's these little things that makes the elephant really excited. Um, we also created training videos for the sales agents to make uh, selling easier. Um, so I'm not going to play the whole thing. Basically, it's instructional. Maybe we can turn it down just a little bit. Um, so uh, in this case, they're talking about how uh, poop transfers through the village. And just so they have a little bit of theory. And then it also uses uh, humor to show, it, to show the reality the That is not a real piece of poop, by the way. Um, but anyways, so they, they show what happens when, when poop's going and how it gets in the food and all these different things. And then towards the end it says, okay, we, we, we identified with sales managers the worst habits that sales agents have. They, they lie, they just go for the quick sale, um, all these different bad habits. And so what we do is we use humor to try to get rid of these bad habits. So in this case, um, it's going to be like never lie. Market salesmen always lie, right? And so here they have a person saying, oh, this shirt, I don't think it fits. And then she's like, it totally fits, it totally fits, right? And then people can laugh about it and they can reflect and they can start to change behavior. We also created objection flashcards uh, so you can see why uh, they, they could practice, okay, if someone's going to say, I'm going to wait for a subsidy, then they can practice what they're going to say in response. And so that's just zooming in on, on one area, um, but it wasn't just with the sales agent. We started to find more users. So in this case, we found that village chiefs, um, they're, not, they're not supportive. Um, and if they're or not, oh, many of them were, but some of them are not supportive. And when they're not supportive, it's very difficult to sell toilets in that, in that village. So we created a, a video. Um, this is a true story. Um, and we have a famous comedian who's talking about, you know, for his job, he, he makes people laugh every day. And as a village chief, your, your, your job is much more important. And, and then they talk about the problem of open defecation and, and how it's making people in the village sick. So it's getting to those emotional heartstrings. Um, but then after that, what we do is we show a true story of a village chief uh, who went around um, and once he heard that easy latrines were in his village, uh, he was very excited. Um, because, and, and then he started literally digging holes with people. Um, and he went door to door. He was working with the uh, commune chief. He was working with the schools. Uh, he was working with the health centers to align everyone to start using latrines. And within four months, uh, he got everyone in the village to start using latrines. 
ตัวตาจงกาวตีจิตตะปุ่มเปิ้ลในក្នុងภูมิบัพพอดบานซ่องมีความจับจิตมวยปัจจุบันum, so they're getting the wrong size rings, and you know that obviously doesn't make people happy with the hassle of you know sending these huge latrines back and forth. Um, so all we did here was design a, a better order form that reduced the amount of error when people were, were taking orders. And also they were not clear on the uh, what to expect and the extra cost after owning the latrine. So we just made that more transparent in the sales pitch, and we also gave them IKEA-like instructions on how to install a latrine. So totally, we, we help cure 18 headaches. And, and ID is a wonderful organization, so the, these stats are, are not just because of our intervention, mostly because of their hard work. Um, but we were able to get some really good numbers. Um, so they went from a 0 to 10% sales conversion rate to 30 to 50% sales conversion rate. Uh, they are able to go from 10,000 uh, uh, latrines sold to 141,000 latrines sold and from 350,000 in revenue to 4,935,000 in revenue. So, oh, thank you. <laughs> Again, it's, it's, it's I mean, we're, we, we, just, we just really give people the, the triggers to help them. I mean, it's the organizations that are doing so much of this hard work. Um, and it, a lot of it comes, again, just from interviewing real customers or real sales agents and finding out where their headaches are so it can go from bottom up instead of top down design. So I'm going to give a service example with a, another great organization called PIN. Um, and they wanted to tackle this issue um, to, to help mothers to take care of their babies better. And so some of the headaches that they found were, OK, well, there's lots of information that's going to this mother. It's difficult for them to understand all the information or remember it. Uh, also, the midwife, if they're not trained well uh, or if they're not into it, then they don't, maybe they don't believe the information or the information's really uh, high context. So they'll just say, OK, keep your baby warm. But what does that mean? Or, or take care, uh, make sure you keep the umbilical cord uh, clean. But usually mothers or nagging mother-in-laws will tell them to put lotion on the umbilical cord, which makes, which makes it infected. So the quality of services were really critical. Um, and so the midwife, they, they need to get these services consistent. And another issue they had were that mothers don't return to the health center. Okay, so we looked at these different headaches. Uh, and this is one of the tools that we created. It was, uh, it's, it's inspired by a crib mobile. This, we made it into a paper mobile toy with a, a light laminate. And each side had different messages that were very concrete uh, and, and very delightful for a mother. And then they had a baby toy that they could use uh, with the baby and remind them of the messages. Uh, they also got IVR robocalls. So this is one of the scripts. Uh, it's, in the, it's, it's, it's said by an a, a, a actor, but acting as a doctor. Um, so it says, hello, bong thrai, like, hello, madam. My name is Dr. Tirith. I'm a doctor in a village just like yours. Congratulations on giving birth to such a beautiful baby. Today, I'm going to tell you about that strange thing sticking out of your baby's stomach, the umbilical cord. By the end of the week, it should look dry and black like a dark sausage. Eventually, it will fall off. But if the cord is soft and wet, red near the stomach, draining puss, bleeding, or starts to smell really bad, take your baby to the health center immediately. Um, so the mothers would get these, these calls. They could listen to the message. They could also repeat the message and give it to um, their husband or their nagging mother-in-laws. right? Um, and to, also to encourage people to call the health center or come back, we put a sticker on people's phones. So, so I'm, from, I'm from the States, uh, so our emergency phone number is 911. I don't know what it is for the UK. I bet most of you who are not from the UK don't know. Um, so also, again, how can we make it ridiculously easier for people to call that health center? So back of the phone, sticker, they see it all the time, like you see choco pies in front of you. If they called the health center, then we also gave the, the, the midwives a checklist of, of different things to talk about so that the messages were consistent. So again, design thinking. Get out of the office, find your user's headaches, cure the headaches, and whoever cures the most headaches wins. And also, going with the same framework, the Elfenreier framework, we made things more delightful, uh, and we made things ridiculously easier for them. So, uh, creative hacks. This is the last part. And I'm going to use the gong again, but I need someone to hit it for me. Nora? <laughs> OK. All right. Let's say you have five days. You're all really, really busy. 
and you need to make uh, some changes to your program or service. Okay? Um, so the common questions that we get, well, okay, how do you find these headaches? How do you think of ideas? And how do you test that the ideas are effective? Now, we can do this in five days, or we can teach others to do this in five days, or uh, very, very quick thing, times. And this is actually how much time the Google design team is spending with their ventures. They, do, they work in what they call five-day sprints. So they just sprint to find the headaches, sprint to think of ideas, and sprint to test them at a very small scale. So I'll show you how we do some of those things and how we've adapted it for the social sector. Um, so we showed you one already. We call it trigger mapping when we're looking at the path, looking at the system. Um, and looking at, in this case, a customer journey. Uh, and just to break it up a, a little bit further, for a customer journey, we think about every interaction like a marriage. Um, so there's a first impression stage. Like, what do they think about toilets at first? Do they, are they interested? Are they not interested? If they're not interested at that stage, unless you convince them, they're not going to go to the next. Um, and same for the courting. They might be really interested in buying a toilet, but if it's awkward and they have to do a bunch of calls to the salesperson and all this, then eh, maybe they just forget it. Um, and then there's the marriage. And this is one of the most critical that we find a lot of programs forget about. Um, you have to put effort into the marriage to make it more delightful. Imagine if Uber, all they cared about was getting us in the car. And then everything else didn't matter, right? It wouldn't be successful. Um, so what we do is we split up these maps into first impression, courting, and marriage into a variety of steps. Um, and I'm going to use Educate Girls, which is a, a Skoll scholar uh, this year. Did Safina come in, or is she, she still out? Okay, I'm, um, look, can I get a, a mic for you? So I, 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 I'm volunteering uh, <laughs> educate girls to talk about their experience trigger mapping. Um, and uh, just to break things at a high level, and I'll let you go into a deeper level, um, we had a, so we, we, at the first impression for educate girls, for example, many parents may think, okay, a girl's duty is to work at home, not just go to school, right? That's the first impression, right? And there's probably other reasons why they may say no or why they may say yes to going to the courting stage. And they have a few different things for the courting, but one of the main things is the pitch to, to parents. Uh, and then there's the marriage, where they sign up the girl, into the, enroll the girl into the school. Um, but then it's not just that. It doesn't end there, right? It's all the interactions in the school, and are, those, are there ways to make it more delightful for the parents um, until she is old enough to graduate uh, from, from school? Um, so, can I, can I ask you, uh, for when you guys did this trigger mapping, so we, we, did, a, we did a training with, uh, with uh, Malungo Foundation Reiner Fellows, and so Safina was there, and we taught trigger mapping uh, during the workshop, and you all used it. Can you talk about that experience, and what was it like for you, and different challenges or, or aha moments that you had? Sure. So, uh, so just to uh, give you a brief about us, so our model is simple. We find each and every girl who's out of school, get her to school, keep her in school, and ensure that she learns well. Uh, the, the problem is that we, before we get a girl to, uh, into school, we have to battle uh, calcified, uh, traditional, centuries-old belief system, which basically treats a girl inferior to a boy. Uh, girls' education now, especially in India, isn't so much about access or opportunity. It's, it's very much about mindset. It's, it's about a belief system. Now, how do you target that? How do you convince a parent or a community that's never been to school about sending uh, their girls to school. So post, uh, uh, post the session at, at Raynor Arnold when Safina came back and, and we had an in-depth discussion, what we did was the first prescription here, uh, get out of office. So we all went out and uh, we sort of shadowed our field, uh, field coordinator and our community volunteer uh, when they go and interact with parents. And we realized that it's 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 not very simple in a, in office in Mumbai. We feel that you know the field coordinator does his job very well, and we are very happy with it. Uh, he gets insulted, doors are slammed on his face. Some of them are driven out of the village as well by the community. So you know, so what's the headache for him? That was step one when a field co uh, coordinator visits the village. That that's that, that's the headache one. Then. Let's say if he makes inroads into the, the, the girl's family, the girl who's out of school's family, then what does it take for him or her to convince the parents? I mean, that's where the headache, because he'll, he'll always get arguments about why no education, why you know, the boy of the family deserves education and not the girl. So then w what else can he do to counter that argument? The third thing is when he gets the girl to school, if a girl has missed half of the year, 
will she get admitted? If she'll get admitted, then what happens? Uh, you know, because she's lagging behind than her peers. So that's the third level of headache. So I, I wouldn't elaborate, but this is how we, we tapped, uh, or, or rather uh, figured out all the headache that our team would would face when they're trying to enroll a girl and you know ensure that she's in school. Uh, based on that, we created a master uh, list of headaches, just a list, and, and we were surprised. Uh, we had over 60 headaches, headache area, oh. I would say. There's actually a summary up, yeah. up there. I printed yeah. it out. Oh, those sheets uh, that yeah. you see? So yeah. the, those were color coded. The white ones were for enrollment. As you can see, the maximum are white ones because that's where it's, it's targeting the belief system. Uh, the, the light blue ones were about retention because once a girl is in school, while well, keeping her in school is difficult, but that's still manageable. And the yellow ones were about the learning outcomes. And that, that, that little uh, uh, chart at the rear is, is essentially uh, a snapshot, a summary of it. So based on that, what, what that is helping us do is uh, initially our training, our, 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 uh, uh, so we, we conduct 12 days of training for our field people. That was very one-way traffic. While we were doing great work, but we realized it was very one-way, it was very prescriptive. Now what we have started doing is it, it's more bottom-up rather than top-down. Now, now that we have realized that this are the kind of challenges. These are the headache that he's he or she is facing. It's it's made us a lot more. Uh, uh, I I don't know. We we have become a lot more empathetic towards the challenges that he face. And as we speak right now, uh, our our uh, our field coordinators in Ajmer district in Rajasthan are actually uh, experimenting with this particular thing. And um, uh, my my program colleague, uh, we were having a Skype call last night, and he told us that. Uh, on a very rough count, 86% of field coordinators are far, far happier with this particular format. And we have 200-odd uh, field coordinators right now. That's so, yeah. You said 86% 86 are preferring the new process. Preferring the new format, yes. Oh, that's great. Yeah, yeah. wonderful to hear. Yeah. So I, I actually hadn't heard that result yet either, so yeah, that's wonderful. Was, uh, yeah, yeah. Just via Skype. It was just now. an update that we were taking. Okay. That's great. Well, well, thank you very much for sharing that. Um, so if you, you want to talk to Educate Girls after, again, there's a, there's a map here and how they did it and all that. And then we have the IDE uh, example up there. Um, so when we're doing this tra trigger mapping, again, do, taking a map to different users is very important. Uh, we also do like secret shopper. It's, it's very, very important. Um, and, and if we're a foreigner in the country, we'll get local people to do it or local staff members to do it. So it's, it's a true secret shopper. And then all us foreigners uh, stay out of it. Um, in this case, for signing up for a mobile banking service, it took 25 minutes. Uh, I can't see that sign. OK, good. Um, it took uh, 25 minutes just to sign up for the service. Uh, why? Um, because there are so many forms, so many, so many forms. Uh, and and uh, our, our secret shopper was role playing uh, as if she was illiterate, which a lot of customers are. Um, and that's kind of a scary experience, right? And so she's asking a lot of questions, and then through that secret shopper experience, we found out, well, the sales agent, it's very difficult for them to answer those questions too. Um, and then we collect the evidence. We found that one of the sales agents um, wasn't even using any of the materials that the company provided them. Um, what they did is they would actually sketch out uh, on a piece of paper how the service worked, uh, which could become uh, motivation or inspiration, rather, for the next set of tools. Um, so what's really important after doing this trigger mapping is to agree on headaches to cure and metrics to test. I'm going to get into metrics uh, in the next thing. Um, we've got maybe five, ten minutes left in the talk. Uh, but using these maps, if you see in the back wall, um, it becomes very exciting because you can bring a group of different decision makers and stakeholders and have a very high powered discussion on where are the priority areas to focus on. Uh, normally when we look at problems, problems are very complex. Um, and it's kind of like looking into a uh, messy room. Um, in the dark and trying to find which problem smells the most. You know, and all these boardroom conversations, we're just talking about different problems. When we do things like this, we can be very focused and we can use visuals. It's like turning the lights on in the room. Um, and so, yeah, this is an example for a pit emptying service. Uh, the red is the highlighted in the areas that we need to cure headaches. Um, this was Educate Girls map. Um, and so how do we think about ideas? Speeding up a little bit. Uh, one of our favorite methods is rapid prototyping, which comes from the tech sector. Um, so in 1989, uh, Jeff Hawkins, I believe is his name, created this tablet. Um, it, was kind of, it was before the iPad. It was kind of the first one of the first tablets out there. And it was a huge failure. Now, Jeff um, created this with Samsung at that time. And he, was, uh, he spent a lot, of, a lot of time, a lot of money creating a prototype. 
And then as soon as he handed the prototype uh, to someone, they, they immediately like, held it and then pushed it back because it was so heavy and hot. And this happened again and again. So the elephant didn't, didn't want to touch it or hold it, right? And he thought, I'm never going to make this mistake again. So what he did is we call what we call slow failure, which basically he's doing a lot of planning and guessing what will work. Uh, and over time, once it actually gets to the, the market or in the test groups, reality hits and it gets very messy. So when we're planning and we're guessing, everything's very safe. And we can think everything is going to plan. But as soon as we hit reality, things start to not work. And what he did is he thought, OK, how do, I, how do I change this? How do I flip this around? How can I learn and iterate from reality? And then based off those learnings, try a, different, a bunch of different things and then execute what works. So what he did was create this for his next project. He took a piece of wood, uh, and then he printed what he thought could be the screen, and he put it in his pocket. And he walked around with it. And he literally would talk to someone and be like, hey, Mitch, uh, what are you doing at Friday? Um, you want to have a coffee? Oh, good, yeah, let me check. And he'd take out his piece of wood, and he'd start hitting it like a crazy person, uh, role playing with this, this piece of wood. right? And he kept changing the screen based off all his learnings on what would be, make a good user experience. right? Um, and this turned into the Palm Pilot, which uh, for some people who know it, it was, it was wildly successful for that period of time. Um, <laughs> So the problem is when we design a lot of programs and services for the poor, this is what we do. Right? We don't get any feedback from them. We just plan and guess what will work, um, or any kind of social system, and then we end up with trash like this, right? Um, and systems that break, or we get schools that are dysfunctional. Right? So what we try to do is to follow this model and do this in the social sector. So learning as fast as we can, iterating from reality, executing what works. Um, so one more example from the tech sector, Google Glass, uh, one of their first rapid prototypes they wanted to create was to see, okay, uh, if we wanted people to control the screen with their hands, um, let's, let's test that out. How long do you think the first rapid prototype took? Any, any guesses for people who don't know the answer already? Huh? Some hours. Some hours, yeah. Took 30, 45 minutes, right? So um, that was a good guess. Usually people guess like six months or two months or something. Um, so yeah, just took 30, 45 minutes. Basically, they, they, tied, uh, they had wristbands tied to some string to, and a projector from behind people, and then they had a clicker. And then people could swipe photos like that. And then they just took their colleagues. And the colleagues tried it. They're like, ah, oh, this is great. This is great. And they're like, oh, my arms are getting tired. <laughs> because going like this is the same as going like that. And so they, they could learn just with a couple people that this would not work at a massive scale. Right? Sometimes when we test things, we think, oh, it has to be tested with a lot of different people. No, sometimes we can just relate to each other as humans. Right? Um, and so in this case, when we wanted to test new ideas here, um, one of the ideas that we created for the, the midwife, and we, we showed this before, this is one of the rapid prototypes. We created this in 30 minutes, and we role played the use of it, and iterated and changed it until we were ready to test with real health centers testing with a, a small uh, number of health centers, iterating, changing, then testing with 20 health centers, uh, and now we're, we're scaling up even further. So we keep iterating based off what midwives are saying. One of our favorite ways to wrap a rapid prototype is what we call a cave sprint. Um, so a lot of brainstorming sessions we feel are really unproductive. right? You might have a bunch of sticky notes, and then, OK, what happens next? Or you're just talking, and then, OK, what happens next? No, this is a very inefficient way to, to brainstorm, because usually you, you have a few people that dominate, and it doesn't really play well for the people who are, are more introverted um, or, or even just fleshing out an idea beyond a sticky note. Um, so in this case, we, we, we set timers, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, and people just try to create their solutions. Of course, you need to do a, maybe a training on how to draw very quickly, but then you can come up with things like the, the baby toy mobile. Um, and then we share the rapid prototypes together. We test them out. Um, so in this case, for this challenge and this headache, uh, about the, the taking a, it's very difficult for these agents to explain what branchless banking was. So these were shopkeepers, right? And they couldn't explain branchless banking to people. And that's part of the reason why it took so long. So when our, when our uh, staff was doing the, our, our, our colleague rather, was doing the secret shopper, she couldn't understand what, what, what it was. And she was just role playing, well, what, what is it, branchless banking? Um, and so we did a rapid prototype of why, why not put something on the counter in front of the sales agent and it can be a little mini bank. And instead of calling branches banking, let's just call it the mini bank. And you can put a little money uh, next to it or something like that. So you can role play it. Oh, hey, what's that? Oh, 
you know that now I'm a mini bank and I can help you transfer money to other mini banks across the country. All of a sudden, it doesn't take a long time to explain what it does. Um, it also is a little bit delightful, right? So, uh, lastly, how to test if ideas are effective. All right, um, so you may have seen this in the, the video. Um, so we don't just go and we create that. Um, we, again, we base it off research. Um, part of the research is observing what others are doing. Um, so we looked at a lot of different materials um, and they all had a bunch of cartoons, right? Um, and all the research, again, for sanitation says that you need to, it needs to be shame or disgust to get people to actually want to use a toilet. Um, but this really doesn't do this. Um, this is kind of like chocolate on top of a cake, right? <laughs> Um, so what we did is we, we thought, okay, probably real poop, that probably creates disgust or shame. I don't know how long you can look at that. I promise you, everyone that worked on this project, after staring at it on the design screen for a long time, we're all germaphobes now. Um, I, <laughs> yeah, I'll share another story at a bar for whoever wants to meet me about this. Um, but uh, yeah, which, one's, which one creates more of an emotion for that elephant, right? Um, and so what we did is we took images from Google um, and we did some handmade photos. That's actually my hand uh, with some brownie on it. Uh, and we just created this very, very quickly. And then what we did is we took it out to the, or we did a few different ones. Uh, and then we took it out to the field and we did a lineup. We took 12 different posters and we said, hey, we want you all to see something. That's it. And we watched them for three minutes. Which ones did they ignore? Which ones did they talk about? Which ones did they invite their children to talk about? Could you see disgust on their faces, right? And then afterwards, we could say like, hey, we noticed that you're, 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 talking, you're holding this one and you're talk, talking to your child about this or you're, you're really, um, you know, you keep pointing to this one. Why, why is that? And then we can get so many more learnings that way, right? Uh, and again and again, we saw of these 12 images, four that were consistently looked at more and talked about more than the others. There was a sense of buzz, right? To verify this further, we did a hidden camera test. So we took, we had, here was the, the real poop style, here's cartoon poop, uh, and then uh, also there were celebrity photo ones. And so we had people come in for, we said that we were going to do a survey about farming or something. We had all these different segments. We took them to this room and said, we'll be right back. And we just let them be in the room. Um, and, and then what we did is we just recorded what happened. We could hear their voices, what they're talking about, and we could see where they're interacting. And what was happening is they, they would go right for the real poop images. They would go to the others and then they would, they would come back and keep talking about it, right? And so they spent 88% more time with the real poop option. It seems if you put a picture of real poop, people love to talk about it. And so that's how we created those things um, and, and these type of posters. Yeah. So again, um, some people say, ask, okay, is this really rigorous enough, right? Um, and these methods are, I don't know how many people know Lean Startup, but we've adapted them from this method. It's still a form of science. It's not a, a rigorous RCT, um, but you can be very, very uh, focused on what you're testing for. You can test for signals that something is working. When, when uh, Google tried this uh, with their Google Glass, they had a signal that, hey, this isn't going to work, and they don't need to test it with thousands of people. Um, or if any of you have children, you know exactly what I mean. How, if, we, if we all raise children, and we said, okay, I'm not going to do it unless there's a randomized control trial that proves that this works. All of our children would be so dysfunctional, right? Um, you experiment, you test, you try things for signals. So in this case, my, my uh, nieces and nephews that live with me, they're always forgetting to turn off the lights when they leave the room. Um, so uh, at first what I tried is when they leave the room, I'd say, hey, um, I think someone forgot the light on, you know, <laughs> like the crazy uncle. Um, and, <laughs> It, it never worked, right? So I was like, okay, I'm going to try something else. So I had them all come in. I said, all right, we're going to play a game. Whoever forget, if someone forgets to turn the light on, someone else um, can point it out, and then they have to do jumping jacks. The first time, they have to do 10 jumping jacks. Second time, 20 jumping jacks, then 30. And then they got really excited, and they, they started pointing to each other, like, oh, that time you forgot about the, the light. Um, and I, I noticed, oh, this is a signal that this might actually work. Um, the next day, I come back. They created a chart. Uh, with everyone's name and the number of jumping jacks, and then they could check and tick it. Within a, within a month, turning off the lights wasn't a problem, right? And this is all based off signals. You can see when things are working or not when you use your elephant and not your elephant rider. Or choco pies. So uh, my assumption was that uh, more people would eat choco pies without the wrapper, right? So what I did is I, I have a purpose. I want to in increase the number of people who eat choco pies while at, uh, at, the, uh, at this... Uh, 
conference. And my hypothesis is that no wrapper group will eat double the choco pies. And we'll test it with the AB plate test. And the result, I was unfortunately wrong about that, but I think it has something to do with the fact that you all exercise too, which is really throwing me <laughs> off. Yeah? But that's fine. Not every, not every test is going to be a success, but at least then you can start to get signals on what's working and what's not. Um, so for, the, for example, for this test, um, we want to see if real poop creates more buzz than cartoon poop, right? And our hypothesis is that groups will spend 50% more time engaging with real poop posters, hidden camera, result was 88%. So we have a signal, hey, there's something here, right? Um, and this can also be for, for very early stage projects. So one of our clients recently, they said, okay, we have garment factory workers. They're at bad factories. We want them to go to better factories. Can we, can we create an app or something innovative? So you see this all the time, and we're like, okay, well, let's first do trigger mapping. We'll understand where, how they are currently changing factories, where are their headache points, and all that. And then we just added a one-minute survey afterwards. So we want to see if the garment factory workers actually use apps. The hypothesis was that 30 out of 100 will actually use an app once a week. We did a one-minute survey, and only four used it. So you have a pretty strong signal there that, hey, this is probably not a very good idea to do right now. Um, and so again, we're learning and iterating from reality. So as soon as we say, OK, let's do an app, we just kind of go and we test it. Oh, that doesn't work. OK, let's go back and test something else. So that was literally just a one-minute survey. Um, that could have saved them tens of thousands of dollars developing something that didn't work. So what's next? Uh, just wrapping up and going to questions. So I talked about the social innovation paradox, this need for, for design. Um, and there's three things that you can go forward with um, to try to break us away from the social innovation paradox. Um, one is that you can be a choco pie and do nothing um, and just keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> uh, two, uh, you can tell foundations to provide design support like Google Ventures. Um, or if you are a foundation, you can act like Google Ventures and invest in design. Um, I have lots of documentation on this if you want to see um, how good of an investment it can be. Um, and again, you'll, get, you'll start to get bumps in all these things once you start investing in design. I'm obviously biased, so I'm sorry if this is too big of a pitch. Um, but ultimately, we're all trying to help uh, social organizations here do, create, uh, do, do better work and to, to help as many people as possible. Um, and design can be a big part of that. Um, and third, we can teach you guys how to do this. So a big part of our mission is to make design so it's not so complicated. Design in itself is, is poorly designed and that there's a lot of buzzwords and all these different things. We try to make it really, really simple. Um, so this is actually uh, what we call trigger mapping in a box. And we can simultaneously teach multiple social organizations at once uh, how to map out their program uh, in a workshop. And there you have paper doll personas and users um, that people can use. Uh, and we're wor currently working on a ideation or brainstorming in a box as well as a testing in a box as well so that people can learn these skills and, and apply it themselves like, like uh, Safina and Educate Girls have done. Um, and it, it breaks up and teaches on how to do these different things. So, um, uh, sorry, again, this is in uh, Uganda where we just had 120 bankers all working on their programs um, at different times. I think there's 12 different groups different mobile banking services, all mapping it out. Um, it doesn't have to be so complicated. Right? Um, and then also going to real users. So with that, um, I want, also want to thank my team. Uh, they're the ones doing so much of this work uh, these days. They're a wonderful, wonderful group. I hope you all can come to Cambodia to meet them. Uh, and then also our clients, uh, because they're the ones doing all the hard work. We're just giving them the triggers uh, to help them make their work easier. So thank you very much. Yeah. Questions? Should I follow Kevin and just go around? So, yeah. Thanks. Awesome stuff. Hi. Dude, seriously, you know, this, it, it strikes me as common sense, but grandma said common sense ain't common. <laughs> I like this. I, it makes a whole lot of sense. I work in the sanitation space as well. Uh -huh. I want to compliment you on one thing. Um, demand driving uh, sanitation, you, you can't just sell stuff to people who don't want it. No, I'm, I'm the writer. I know how it's not good to defecate in the open, but that elephant says it's sunny outside, man, and there's a lot of bush out there. There's a lot of desert. There's, why would I go into a stinky toilet? Mm -hmm. So uh, congratulations for getting far enough, you know, early enough in the process to identify what those triggers are uh, to make the rest of the process more successful. Thank and, you. and lastly, challenge to you and educate girls. Uh, menstrual hygiene management is the next big thing to 
keeping girls in school, particularly once they get a little bit older and reach puberty. If you want to keep girls in school, they need privacy, they need gender disaggregated latrines, menstrual hygiene products, and so on. I bet you guys are already doing that, but I'd uh, welcome an opportunity to learn more offline. Thanks. So, so, thank you very much. I, I have one quick note on also testing ideas, and, and, and some, some ideas you, you can get from other people very easily. We strongly encourage that. And I, I was just in Bhutan, and I was meeting with one of the, the senior uh, government there uh, for, for in, the, in the Ministry of Education. And they had done a program for, for menstrual hygiene where they actually educate the, the boys and the girls at the same time. And they found that it works very, very well because then the boys are supportive instead of teasing the girls about it. Now, this is a great example where you have a signal from another country that this could work really well. Um, and maybe you can try it in one or two schools. How does it work? Is, is it working, right? And you can, you can start to look for those signals. So yeah, we can, we can talk, uh, talk more after. Other questions? Uh, yeah. yeah, thanks. I was Sorry, na name, name and, uh, yeah, name and organization. My name is Caroline Fines. I work for Giving Evidence, and we work on getting charitable giving to be based on decent evidence. Um, so my question is around the lots of behavioral insights and lots of nudges are designed where there is a single thing that we're asking or trying to encourage people to do. So to give up smoking, to eat chocolate biscuits, to use the loo, whatever. In There are two areas where I'm really interested where there are, if there isn't a single thing that we're asking people to do. So for example, in philanthropy, if we're asking donors to be effective, there isn't one thing we're asking them all to do. And similarly, I do some work around evidence-based medicine, and we're not asking each doctor to do the same one thing. There's quite a complicated set of considerations that we're asking them to look at in each decision that they make. And so I just wonder what I wanted to hear your view about what do, what do we do? How do we apply the kind of nudge thinking or whatever, where there's quite a complicated set of things that we're asking people to do? That's a, that's a very good question. Um, I, I think that's partly why we, we map things out visually, right? So again, our, our minds are like messy rooms. Uh, and so in this case, we, we spend, sometimes we spend a, a one week entirely just with, if it's a very complicated situation, to li literally map out everything. Uh, and then we can try to find uh, focus on where are the, the highest priorities. And th there often are more than one thing, but there are also often more than one user. Um, so we, we are working with eight different ministries in uh, Cambodia, as along with UNICEF. Um, and they wanted to do a, a strategy and, and get ministries to commit to different, basically different things to end violence against children. Um, and so they had 50 pages of recommendations. Uh, and they, they, UNICEF came to us and said, we, we aren't getting these, these ministries to, to uh, to, to uh, agree on different recommendations. They just place, they, they're, they're just, everyone's just wordsmithing from English to Cambodian language to English to Cambodian language, and this isn't getting anywhere. Um, can, you, can you help us? So we said, yeah. So we took the 50 pages, we visualized everything. I actually have some slides on this. I, I put bonus slides just in case people ask certain questions. So you actually <laughs> unlocked one of the bonus slides. Yeah. Um, so, so we look at information. When we are verbally using information, talking like we are now, or if we are just reading reports, we're actually operating like MS-DOS. Um, people say that they're not visual people, but 30% of our brain is dedicated towards processing visuals, subconsciously or consciously. Um, and that's why this is so much easier to use of an experience. And the same can go for our information. So I think, or rather than I think, I hope that we can get to a point where information becomes more visual because we're able to digest it so much more. You look at things like that, yeah, it is easy to digest because our brain is geared to, up to, to recognizing visuals. If I wasn't visual, I wouldn't be able to pick this up without looking or remembering where things are, right? Um, we're, we're highly visual people. So what we did with that report is we started to visualize in the different recommendations that they are giving. So in this case, I believe blue was uh, law, green was prevention, yellow was response, orange was M&E, and we started to put pink sticky notes for when things didn't make sense or they were too, too much jargon. Um, so this was just the start of it. And then we, we took and we made fictitious users. So Toa, a five-year-old who's been abused, or Tita, a 16-year-old who's been raped. Sorry, it's a little bit serious topic. But then what is their system? What is their journey from going to, to being abused and what, what happens on their journeys? And then there's two different, you might see there's two different pathways there. Um, and, and pink was where we had questions. And so we took these to the different ministries. Um, and what was really interesting is that a lot of the data pretty much mean the same thing. So for here, um, you know, the girls weren't doing something because it's shy and they're embarrassing or they're afraid of questions in a public setting 
or you know, and these were all different different gap points or, or, or concerns here, but they all kind of mean the same thing, right? And so actually throughout the map we had things that overlapped and it became much, much more simple. And then what we did is we basically had all the different recommendations uh, and gaps rather, and then pink was where there were still questions and yellow was, was where different ministries could actually commit to different actions. Um, and so yeah, it wasn't just one thing, there was many things, but what was most fascinating for this was that in the response, there was a huge area where um, basically perpetrators of abuse were staying in the villages, right? And this was not listed in one of the recommendations. And so that's really, really powerful. And it, the reason why it didn't come out is because, our, our, again, we're, we're, our minds are just messy rooms when we're just speaking or writing. Whereas if we start to look it out like a system, it becomes much more uh, clear where the real issues are. Yeah. Thank you. I'm uh, Namrita Kapoor from Environmental Defense Fund, and yes, I found this very compelling. Um, I'm wondering, in my case, uh, the constituent population I'm trying to influence are companies, and I don't often have as uh, unfettered access as you might have to some of these examples you showed to find out what, where are the pain <laughs> points. And so I'm wondering if you have any tricks or tips about how to assess that when you don't have that good access to the population. That's a great question. Uh, I do not. <laughs> um, but I guess what I would, uh, I mean, I, I don't know how few people you're talking to. I don't know if it's like, you know, when you're working with one organization and you know someone that knows the VP or the president and you can take them out for drinks and <laughs> talk. But uh, that, that, that's a bit informal. Um, uh, I, I would then, I'd probably focus more on the emotions because a lot of times when we're trying to convince uh, boards or, or you know bosses to do things. We're using rational arguments, um, but use emotion first and then use rationale after. Um, so we had one project where um, we we're trying to convince the, the government to stop using bricks. Um, I, I, if I remember correctly, it was a while ago to stop using bricks for their their sanitation um, uh, projects uh, because it, it doubled the cost of a, a, of a latrine. Right, and so you can put that in a power slide, PowerPoint slide, and it'll just kind of disappear, right? Um, so um, what we did there is we we literally took a brick and put it right in front of the uh, the I don't know if it was minister, but the government person just put it there, and like this 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 is a reason why uh, you know toilets are costing double what they should, and so you hit that emotion, and then it, it becomes very clear for them. So I guess I'd encourage that. Yeah. If I could just ch share a, a cheap story, having read the book Switch, whenever I do fundraising, I, I always go for the elephant first. I tell a personal story. I tell something that engages the emotion before I start with any numbers, before I start with anything about what's the real problem. It's like, how do you get to someone's heart? Mm. And then you go to their head, and then you tell them what you want them to do. Right. And it may be you want them to give you money, or you want influence, but it's about getting the elephant, then get to the rider, and then... Make sure eventually you tell them what path you want them on. And if you miss any of those parts, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So yeah, just, I mean, just thanks for, for sharing your, your path. Definitely. I saw a question here, sorry. Yeah, my name is Lori Michaels. I run Open Road Alliance. And um, I work to help nonprofits when, they, um, when their underfunded projects run into trouble and roadblocks. Um, most projects are underfunded from the beginning. And so when you're talking about adding a design factor in, even though it would be cost effective at the end, what kinds of ways would you suggest a nonprofit could actually pay. convince um, a funder to pay for that up front, since that's just really generally not their stance? We're, we're trying to figure that out ourselves. I mean, we, right? <laughs> I mean, it's not, it's, it, it, I, the, there's a great uh, marketer named Seth Godin, um, who who's a, some of you may know. Uh, he has this uh, phrase, I guess, that you can't change someone's worldview, um, which I'm kind of trying to do right now, but it, it, can be, it can be very, very difficult to change people's worldview. So if design is just a glossy extra add-on, uh, or it's something that you can get from someone's brother who designs logos, um, and that's all it is to people, it's very, very hard to convince them. So, um, uh, yeah, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I would, uh, if you figure out a way, I'd, I'd love to know. Um, I, yeah. I think it's a case yeah. study, yeah. like the way that you portrayed the stories and the results. Mm, mm. That says it all, you know, from my perspective. So we need more case studies. Yes, yes. 
Hire us. Hire us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Did you have a question as well, or sorry? Okay, I'll, I'll go here and then there. Yeah. Hello, uh, my name's Josh Hajio. I'm a journalist. Hi, Josh. Um, I wrote a story about behavioural insights a few months ago, and one of the things that came up um, when I was doing it was kind of the fact that, in a way, you're sort of nudging people to a particular hate behaviour, but inevitably that means that maybe some other behaviour is sort of moved away from. And in all the examples you gave, it, it seemed like it was very good, and I, I'm really, really impressed with what you're talking about. But do you have to be quite careful that, you know, for example, maybe there was somebody who was, I don't know, selling some kind of, for example, in the latrine example, maybe there was somebody who was selling, I don't know, something that could decontaminate land or something, and then you put them out of business. It's just a silly hypothetical example. Uh, but do you yeah. have to be quite careful about that, and then how do you do it? Well, that, that, so we started originally as an advertising and, and marketing agency for good causes. And, and actually one of our first projects, we were working with the uh, Vietnamese government and with uh, one of the largest insurance companies there. And they wanted to create a, a drought insurance for, for coffee farmers. Um, and so they had their pilot and they wanted us to help to make the pilot successful, get a lot of people to, to use it. Um, and so insurance is complicated, right? We, difficult to understand how to use it. So we're like, okay, we wanna make this really basic. So let's, let's start to map it out and look at how it works so we can use these in the sales materials. Um, so as we were mapping out the steps, we had a persona, Mr. Huang, and okay, how does Mr. Huang, uh, if, if he has drought, what happens? Okay, he has to go to Ho Chi Minh City. Okay, interesting. Has he been to Ho Chi Minh City before? And he has to make a claim. Okay, so that was kind of a, uh, could be a potential headache. Uh, but then after that, what, what was even bigger is that once he would actually get the money, um, the claim money, he actually would have lost all his crops for the amount of time that would have passed. And the government didn't see that before, and the insurance company didn't see that before. Uh, and the, the, the person that was running the project took Mr. Huang, the little piece of paper, he's like, you don't know Mr. Huang, you don't know Mr. Huang, you don't know Mr. Huang. Um, and then they, they, canceled the, they canceled the pilot. Um, and they, they, they took us out to dinner and, and he said, thank you so much, we almost actually did something really bad and we're, we're, this was supposed to be social. Um, and so that was a huge lesson for us and, and we've seen that happen more, uh, it, it continues to happen sometimes in different ways where um, I think what I especially see is that if you're trying to increase the demand of something but if the supply is not there, um, you're gonna kill your long-term goals. So if, if you're doing mass media, um, which not many clients do, but, but some have approached us, they wanna do a radio or TV campaign uh, for a service that just isn't, isn't, isn't ready yet. Um, so that's when we, as a company said, we're gonna work more on system and service and program design and keeping the, the marketing as, uh, and advertising as a second step. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's, it's hard and, and we try to choose best we can. Um, yeah. Hey, yeah. thank you. Oh, so, uh, see here? Yep. Um, so, uh, thank you very much. Actually, I'm uh, kind of uh, enthralled here to run into chance by people who are using uh, Instead tool I met from Instead. So, oh, yes, mobile yes. stuff, yeah. Superheroes yes. using our stuff makes us very happy. Uh -huh. Thank you. Um, so, I wanted to comment a little bit on the question about how do funders engage with this. And we're in a similar situation because we help with a lot of technology heavy uh, sort of projects. And the way that uh, design is kind of helping them, uh, we help them see it as a, as a way as a risk management aspect where you're helping offload some of the risk in choosing a portfolio. So the rapid prototyping efforts, what we do sometimes with funders is we say, you don't have an on the ground experience and knowledge and people will just send you reports and proposals and you don't have a way to cut through that. So how about engaging early on in the life cycle of a pr uh, funder initiative some early prototyping work where you do a, like a little bit of testing the waters with idea design and super small pilot implementations and basically front load the risk, get that reality messiness in early and then don't have to wade through 75 page proposals which you're not really sure always say all the truth, right? So that's one way we've uh, encouraged at least in the tech and design space to front load the design work and I think uh, 17 triggers uh, it's like you know, pointing at that in terms of like how you reduce the risk and can guarantee a better result. Exactly, yeah, exactly. So thank you, I'm gonna hand over the thank, microphone. Yeah, la last question, thanks. That was, uh, thank you for sharing, that was right on. It's not actually a question, it's a, it's a suggestion to you. Write up the cases, write them up as one-pagers, publish them, 
so that they're publicly available and they can be used by all of these wonderful people who want to bring design into their funding proposals. Because if you can bring evidence in, if you can use those case studies, you can say, we can use this to mitigate risk, use the Huang story. We can use this to, mm -hmm. to increase sales and use the, the latrine story. Mm -hmm. and, and because if you can, you have to be able to show the funders why you're mm. you're adding this expense. And, and so probably we use the cases yeah. <laughs> and, and explain the rationale. Perfect. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much for coming. Yeah.